Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our continuing uh, colloquia on uh, recognizing our senior faculty. Uh, today, uh, this is this is a this is a program that was developed a few years ago to again have our senior, namely full professors who have been in rank for more than seven years to have a chance to present their work, talk about their experiences, talk about their, uh, uh, the, the, the way they got to where they are. And, uh, and then, actually, once they present this colloquium, uh, they get a chance to talk to the department head, of course, in this case, you know, <laughs> but the dean, for sure, and talk about you know, the next seven years. And so uh, today we have a great pleasure of having Professor Govindaraju, who is uh, your, our department head in civil engineering. So he got his PhD in 1989 from University of California, Davis. And uh, before he came to Purdue, he worked as an assistant and associate professor at Kansas State. He joined <coughs> Purdue in 1997 and currently, he's the Bowen Engineering Head of uh, Civil Engineering and Christopher B. and Susan S. Berg, Professor of Civil Engineering. His primary, primary area of research includes surface and subsurface hydrology, contaminant transport, watershed hydrology, and statistical hydrology. And I think I will stop right there before I go any further. And so we're really excited to hear what he has to share with us today. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Claude. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I think we have been to several of these uh, symposia. I have attend, uh, attended all the ones that civil faculty were presenting, including some from outside departments. So it's been a good learning experience. <coughs> Uh, one of the things, as Claude points out, is typically after this presentation, the person has a conversation with the department head. So Claude, I promise I'll have a very stern conversation with myself. <laughs> and uh, uh, this actually gives me a chance to sort of marshal my thoughts, as, as Claude mentioned, see what I have been doing, take stock of where I am, and also perhaps try and do some forecasting as to what I think I'll be doing in the future. I would like to actually also mention that uh, in this talk, even though as faculty we do a lot of things which fall in the categories of discovery, uh, learning, and engagement, uh, you know, or research, teaching, and service, uh, I have focused more on the research part, primarily because that is where almost all my scholarship is. You know, that is where I have done research, published papers, and so on. I also perhaps should put the word experiments under quotes to indicate that this is not just physical experiments, but I'll also be talking about numerical experiments, theoretical experiments, and so on. So as Claude mentioned, my broad areas of research interest, surface and subsurface hydrology, contaminant transport, and related topics, but I'll be focusing mostly on surface and subsurface hydrology in this talk. Uh, my research drivers, what I think of, are typically stochastic processes. I look at scaling behavior, very interested in spatial heterogeneity, uncertainties, and risk. So some of the topics that I will talk about will have borrowed from these, uh, these uh, areas. And I'll present a mix of experimental, theoretical, and numerical work in some of these areas. And as I'm doing this, uh, I'll perhaps uh, take some examples uh, with uh, some of the graduate students that who have worked with me, and I'll try and recognize them along the way. Okay. I also want to first start by acknowledging some of the funding agencies, not all. I have been fortunate to have been my research supported by a diverse set of agencies, including some uh, international funding agencies. Uh, even though I was uh, very instrumental in preparing proposals and so on, I think most of the funding that came to me finally was for travel and me for conducting experiments there. It did not per se support graduate students and my summer support, but it did uh, provide me with lots of opportunities to do very interesting work. So I wanted to recognize them as well. 
So let me start with uh, something on pore scale mechanics. Okay. Those of you who work in porous media will perhaps recognize this. This is Jack Chan, one of my uh, master's and PhD students, you know, way back, very bright chap. And some of the things that he was doing was essentially using mathematical morphological operations and image analysis techniques. So those of you in the geomatics area will be familiar with this. When we look at images, we can do, process, we can do operations like erosion and dilation to essentially extract features from images. And he was essentially doing this to study uh, pore scale properties in, in porous media. And this is an example of essentially one cube. So this is just an image, 3D image, with voxels with one pore. And he's looking at what happens at different pressures, how water enters the pore, and how water comes out of the pore. And the red portion that you see is what is the air phase. So if you have air and water in a pore, at different pre water pressures, air will actually go and invade the pore space. So it's all saturated first and it's draining now. That means air is slowly entering and at different pressures you can see, so the value of D indicates pressure, how air enters that particular single pore. And the reverse process, wetting, as the water pressure increases, how basically water will come and invade the pore and eventually dry out. But even with a single pore, you are able to demonstrate hysteresis effects sometimes called the ink bottle effect in, uh, in hydrology. So this is for a single pore at a pore scale. Uh, what Jack then did was essentially constructed a porous medium in, uh, in the computer. It's an image, it's a 3D image where essentially all the pore space is conceptualized as intersecting spheres. So any pore shape that you get, I can approximate it as closely as I want using spheres. Okay. And this is just one image of that. So the blue portion that you see is essentially the pore space. Okay? And then using, again, image analysis techniques, what, he's able to, or what we were able to do is show how a soil that is completely saturated will slowly be invaded by air and become unsaturated. And therefore, this allows us to take care of not only ink bottle effects, but how well the pores, pores are connected and so on, which is something that we have not been able to do in, in previous methods. Okay. So what you are seeing is at different pressures, how basically air goes and invades the pore space. And the rivers, when, we are, when wetting is happening, how water will enter back and drive the, uh, drive the air out of the pore space. So this is a, these are fairly fundamental things that we need for understanding subsurface hydrology. So this is all in images first, right? So then, what, uh, what we did was, how do we go from these images to actually talking about soil properties? So as an example, this is an image that is taken of a loam soil. So this is an SEM image. You can take MRI images using the actual image, okay? Using the actual image and then using the, the theories that we developed, we were able to develop what is called a soil water retention curve, which talks about what the water content is in the soil at different water pressures. It's a very fundamental property. These, uh, the symbols that you see, these are actually experimental measurements. What you see are different old competing theories, but these theories, the prediction is based on fitting the data that you have. Whereas a theory that we developed with Jack actually uses the image and predicts what this should be. Okay, so these experiments are fairly long and painstaking to do a soil water retention curve using pressure plate apparatus can take as much as six months to a year to do one single graph like this. Okay. And from there, we can actually ex uh, also predict what the hydraulic properties of the soil will be at different levels of saturation. And what you see, of course, are these are the symbols. This is our theory. So from here to translate to here, the other curves tell you what the existing theories would show you. So you can argue, well, GS, you chose one example where your theory worked very well. So I want to say that Jack actually did this, whoops, sorry, for 120 different soils. Okay. So for 120 different soils, basically using stochastic theories of either impenetrable spheres or fully penetrable spheres, we can actually predict based on knowing bulk properties like the soil porosity, and the uh, interfacial surface area, which are easily measurable, what soil properties should be. Okay. So this is at the- too much difference. 
Yes. That's right. So not, not much different. They are different models, but they're trying to address the same problem. A different way or a different conceptualization of what the pore scale should be like. So they should be giving similar results. Uh, fully penetrable spheres, however, gives you much more realistic representation of the, of the pore space. Okay. So the model that I had showed you of the soil, that was a fully penetrable spheres model. So basically from pore scale to how do we get to you know, uh, bulk properties of soil. So from pore scale, let me move to another set of experiments which I've been doing with my colleagues in Italy. And this is perhaps one of my most long-standing collaborations. These are essentially what you would call lab scale experiments, lab bent scale. So this is about one and a half meters by 75 centimeters by 75 centimeters. So we create sandboxes, <clears throat> very well controlled, as homogeneous as possible, to essentially understand when rain occurs on soil, what is happening to the water? How can we quantify it? So we have various places where we can collect some surface water. You see some wires running down. They are going to different depths in this. These are TDR probes that measure soil water content. And we also did experiments where we grew grass on that surface to examine different effects. This is Emily Anderson. She was a master's student. In fact, she was here sometime last week to revisit campus and talk about some of her experiences. So in her master's work and some other students, we did a lot of work over here. These are my colleagues in Italy, faculty members, staff member, and so on. But I have spent a lot of time over there you know, doing these experiments. So at the lab scale, so some of the results that we look at are essentially when a rainfall event occurs, how much surface water we are getting, and when rain stops, how surface water essentially vanishes. What is happening in deep flow? That means as water enters the soil, we are able to collect it from below. And this is what the behavior of that water looks like. How does the water content change within the, within the sandbox to sort of understand rainfall and runoff processes? And if we go grass on the surface, so we will have a very strong deep flow component, a smaller surface flow component, and again, water contents being measured in the soil. So we did over 100 experiments like this. We analyzed them, and one of the things that we found was our existing theories of infiltration, which we think we understand very well. They do not, they're not adequate to explain some simple behavior over slopes. Okay. So some fundamental questions uh, are so the mechanism of unexpectedly long recession. So for clay soils, essentially once rainfall stopped, we still collected quite a lot of uh, surface water. Whereas all theories would say once the rain stops within a couple of seconds, we should not be collecting any surface water. We also found that our existing theories do not explain very well what happens when water is moving over a sloping surface. So all our celebrated theories that we have, none of them were actually explaining the data very well. So this is something that we are still working on and still trying to you know, uh, explain this. Some other experiments that we conducted or we continue to conduct in Italy through my collaborations is from the lab scale, we now move to what we we'll call a small plot or a field scale. So this is a nine meter by nine meter area where we have simulated rainfall experiments we can do. We do natural rainfall experiments. We essentially collect surface flows. Um, we also have uh, soil moisture probes which tell us how the water content is beneath the soil. We are also able to uh, catch the deep drainage and work with that. So a much larger scale. And Richa was a PhD student. So one of the things that Richa was interested in, where she used some of this information, is the problem of scaling. Now scaling, I must tell you, mean, means different things to different people. Okay? So in this context, what we are looking at is, let's say this is the plan view of the soil that we just saw, nine meters by nine meters. We know that uh, soil hydraulic properties tend to be highly variable in space. So this is just a conceptualization. These different colors show the amount of variability in this supposedly homogeneous soil. The saturated hydraulic conductivity typically varies a lot. Okay? And trying to essentially determine water movement over such a heterogeneous surface for a rainfall event is fairly complex. So if we want to run a numerical model, we would be running, it would take a lot of effort, a couple of days on a very powerful computer to do one rainfall experiment because you have to model the heterogeneous soil. 
So in this scaling behavior, what she is looking at is a problem which we are frequently interested in is what is, how is the water content or moisture content of the soil surface changing with time? Okay. So if we knew the behavior of how saturated hydraulic conductivity varies, let's say M1, M2, M3 are three locations where you have soil probes, soil moisture probes where you are measuring the water content. And for a rainfall event, we essentially have data which show how the water content change with time at these three locations. And because they are spatially variable, the way they change in time will be very different. So the idea of scaling is if we have this kind of information, are we able to use the physics that we know to collapse all this into one reference curve? And having the reference curve, are we able to then determine at some unmeasured location if I know just the saturated conductivity of this location, how water content will change with time, just from this reference. So not having to solve the full surface flow, surface flow equation, which are extremely complex. So that is scaling. <clears throat> and I made the problem a little simpler than it sounds. She did that. She went back to that field. And then this is what essentially her scaling results look like. So at three locations in that field, we have measurements of surface water, uh, uh, um, soil moisture content. <clears throat> and then what she does is she uses the measurements at, let's say, two locations to essentially predict what it would be at the third location. So the symbols are essentially the measurements, and the green line is the scaling model. So similarly, if she's trying to predict over here, she uses the measurements obtained at these two locations to predict what it is at the third location. If we are able to do that, it's a huge savings because, as I said, trying to do this numerically is a huge challenge. And when she's doing these predictions, what you see is a scatter plot which shows us several different events, how well we were, try we were able to predict this quantity just through scaling relationships. So this is like more like a plot scale kind of analysis. Then she further worked on the problem of aggregation and disaggregation, which is also fairly important for us. The problem of aggregation essentially says, well, if I have these three measurements and I have a scaling theory, can I predict what the field scale average soil moisture would be? Because at, at that scale, that is of interest to us. And what this shows is for different kinds of cases, if you have numerical results, we can use those and see how well the average is predicted by our scaling problem. The reverse problem is if I'm given the field scale average, can I then use that to predict what is happening to soil moisture at a given location? Because this is the problem we face. When we do remote sensing, we are sensing a very large area and giving, getting one average value for that. For ground tooth, however, we go and measure at a point. So how do we reconcile between these two scales? So when she does the disaggregation with her theory, you can see that we struggle. We do fine, but once rain stops, it's very difficult to get those to agree. So disaggregation, that means given the average to predict individual behavior, that is a much harder problem. Okay. So this was you know, more like lab scale results and so on. Let me move to watershed scales. Okay. So for watershed scales, I'm going to talk about, start with talking about Latif Collins' work. Latif was also a PhD student here. Uh, he was looking at a very interesting problem. So this is essentially a map view of a watershed. A watershed is an area where essentially when rain falls through the stream network, it funnels all the water and essentially moves them downstream through the stream network. Okay? So when we do imp uh, management strategies, we look at watershed scales. And watersheds are divided into sub-watersheds. And within each sub-watershed, we assume that properties are homogeneous. Okay? And then we try to model the behavior. What we typically have to contend with is that our measurements are usually made just at the watershed outlets. We are measuring flow. We are measuring how much sediment is going on. A very important problem for us is with this measurement, let's say we have sediment we, we are measuring, where is it originating in the watershed? So can we do that back calculation? So this inverse problem tends to be very difficult to do. So if I use one rainfall event, so this is a rainfall event where we had rainfall and then we had sediment essentially come out, what you see are the model results, which is a solid line. The circles are the experimental observations. And then this is another event, this is another event, and so on. So if I use each event, 
and try to use this data to figure out where the sediment would have originated. With each different event, we get a different answer as to which area was contributing to sediment. So that is the nature of the experimental data we have, the fact that our models are not perfectly accurate, and of course that the inverse problem is, tends to be an ill-posed problem. So what essentially we conceptualize with him is we will treat the sediment generating potential of each of these sub areas as a random variable because that's the only way we could get our minds around this problem. And so with each experiment, the values of let's say the erosion potential that we get in each of these sub areas is one value that this random variable is taking, one realization. Once we are able to do that, then if we have many of these events, we have many samples of these random variables, and then we can use statistical methods to compare how significantly different one area is from the other in terms of its sediment generating potential. So basically you had to rethink the problem, think outside the box to be able to address, but we do need <coughs> many rainfall events to be able to do this well. So a lot of data to be able to do this well, and that's usually a challenge for us. Uh, Mazda Karabi, another PhD student, also working on water sh watershed scale problems, he was doing optimization studies. So when we do water quality in stream networks, we are very much concerned about uh, you know, what is the status of the watershed, what is the health of the watershed, are water quality standards being met. So for sediment, 30 milligram per liter, let's say, is a concentration that EPA or some other body says is what should be acceptable. If you go beyond that, we are violating a standard. One way to address these kinds of problems is we essentially have best management strategies that we place in the watershed, either in the upland areas or in the stream. And these essentially help reduce the load that is coming out of the watershed. Okay. And we have various options for these, glass waterways, wetlands, parallel terraces, and so on. So one of the things MathDAD did was essentially use optimization methods to say how they should be placed in a watershed to obtain best results. Best results either in terms of, for a given cost, how to distribute them to obtain the lowest concentrations, or if we want to meet a concentration standard, how to essentially place the BMPs to, uh, to, uh, to achieve those standards. And again, so very large optimization problems, also fairly challenging. So some of the questions that we have been interested in are listed over here. So what role do best management practices play? How do we use water quality data to assess the overall health of a watershed, and so on? So this is another, uh, another basically a sub-watershed. This shows you what the land use is. And he used fairly advanced technique like generalized likelihood uncertainty estimation, regionalized sensitivity analysis, tree structure density estimation. And those, th these are fairly advanced concepts for the time that you know, he, he was working on, on these problems. But what they would allow you to do is take this very large optimization problem, but give managers an indication of what kind of practice should be placed where in the watershed to achieve best results. Okay. But still a uh, fairly complicated problem. Then I want to talk a little bit about a larger scale than watersheds, regional scale, state level, country level. You know. And here, this is Shivan Tripathi, another of our PhD students. His main focus was essentially how to engage uncertainty that we have with measurements. And this is a very important problem for us. Uh, in this case, he basically was working with a latent variable approach in a Bayesian framework using graphical models such as hidden Markov models. We will talk about this. And the idea is, is encapsulated over here that measurement is always an approximation or, es or estimate of the measurement. We measure something. If we know our instrument well enough, we also have a measurement error that comes along with it. A lot of time, we leave the measurement error alone. And that is particularly a problem in, in hydrology. So I'll give a couple of examples. So sea surface temperature, so those of you who are into global circulation models and how we do forecasting and so on, one of the primary inputs to all these large models that, you know, that work on this is sea surface temperature. So El Nino, La Nina, they're all based on sea surface temperature values. So sea surface temperature is a very important boundary condition. It influences atmospheric variability and so on. It is used for long-range climatic forecasting in general circulation models, in climate change studies. 
And what this picture is trying to show you is not the sea surface temperature, but the uncertainty associated with the sea surface temperatures. So over time, sea surface temperature data has been measured or estimated using remote sensing platforms through ships passing through, they measure temperature, buoys that are placed in water, they gather temperature data. And this is showing you four snapshots in time, May 1850, 1900, 1950, 2000. What you can see is how the density of measurements has changed with time. But what this is also sh showing is what is the variability that we have, what standard deviation, how much error we associate with each of these sur sur sea surface temperature estimates. Okay. So we have this information, but currently none of the GCMs use that. None of the models use that. It's too complex a problem. Similarly, if I look at other data sets, we did quite a bit of work over India. So this is essentially rainfall data. So that data, when it's generated, when it's made available, the error or signal to noise ratio is also provided to us. But nobody uses that information. It's too, people feel it's too complicated to deal with the uncertainty information. Okay. So this was essentially, or has been, continues to be one of the focus or foci. What we did was we developed models which would explicitly account for this uncertainty. And these are graphical pictures. So in very simple terms, graphical models, we have essentially an x variable. We construct a model. We have the model error. Okay. We use Bayesian nonlinear uh, non principal component analysis or noisy principal component analysis, principal component analysis to reduce dimensionality, or uh, this is RVM, VN RVM, relevance vector machines. Again, variable noisy relevance vector machines. Uh, these are essentially for regression and BN correlation, Bayesian noisy correlation to essentially do correlation studies. I guess the important thing with each of these is with the variables that we are measuring, we associate an error, but we assume that we know the error. And then how do we implement it? So these are actually fairly standard things that we do in statistical hydrology. In fact, all of us do it. When we do correlation, you fit something for y versus x. How many of us actually use the error information in x if it's available, or the error information in y if that is available? If you did have that information, your strategy for correlation would change a lot. So I'll show you some examples of how this works. Uh, and in machine learning, what they have is if you want to do something, you have, they give you bench data sets, benchmark data sets. You have to show your algorithm how well does it perform on these benchmark data sets. So for example, this is the sync function. The sync function looks like this, the solid blue line. Okay. What is provided to us so that is what we are trying to reconstruct, if you will. What is provided to us are these symbols. So these are the measurements, and they come with a lot of error. But this is the original function that they were supposed to represent. What we do know is the measurement value and the error associated with it. If I use a relevance vector machine, which was state of the art, it's a very good technique, this black line is what I would reconstruct from these error measurements as the true signal. But if I can use the variational noisy relevance vector machine, which now incorporates the error in this data explicitly, then this green line is essentially what I would reconstruct. So the fact that I am given error information helps me greatly in reconstructing the series. So if I have missing values and so on, I can do very well. So these are benchmark sets. This is another benchmark set that we have to worry about in. Uh, when we deal with data. This is the actual data. This is the image that I would be trying to reconstruct. What I'm given is noisy and incomplete data. Not only are there errors, there are gaps in the data. I need to fill this to be able to do my analysis. So probabilistic principal components, dine off, regularized EM, these were the state-of-the-art models. And this shows you, if I apply these methods, how well I can, re I can reconstruct this, this image. And um, but if I'm able to incorporate the error information which is provided, then the method that we came up with, you know, reconstructed much, much better. Okay. Uh, another example of a, of a benchmark data set is when we use dimensionality reduction. So this is essentially a data set that was created by essentially giving 100 examples. The data is supposed to have, it's 20 dimensional, so there are 20 points in this direction. It has only five independent vectors but it has noise, and so when we do data reduction, we want to be able to extract this. 
if I use standardized principal components or probabilistic principal components, this is what I extract. If I use the Bayesian no noisy principal components, we get those exact five, only those five vectors back. But that's because none of these methods would, would ingest the uncertainty information. So we basically leave it behind, and I think we, we do not, uh, we can do so much better. Uh, so let's look at some actual data sets. So this is essentially over India. This is the All India Summer Monsoon region. GCMs will provide you data at all these grids. And then GCMs also do all sorts of ensemble averaging, <coughs> which means many GCMs are run and somehow their average is taken. Computationally very intensive. And this is our state of the art right now. You know. So if we do that, this is essentially trying to do, show you how, it work, how well it works. This is time in years. This is the rainfall anomaly. And the box plot and the spread is essentially from the ensemble. The, the observed values are essentially the crosses. So even the GCM ensembles, we don't do all that well. If we use relevance vector machines, we don't do great, but we are better than GCMs. And that is uh, reasonably well known. GCMs are, are, are still very complicated, difficult to do prediction with those. Some other examples, if I'm trying to forecast what is happening, uh, let's say for All India summer monsoon for the months of May, our existing methods would give this as a forecast. So where this red line is observation, the blue is the mean of our prediction, and this gives you an idea of what the spread is. With more advanced methods, you get perhaps a slight improvement. The table below shows you what the error statistics are. I should also point out that we're going to testing phase. Our performance is actually not great. It's pretty weak. But really, that is our prediction skill with the best methods possible. Uh, Ganesh is sitting right here. He works in hidden Markov models. So you know, when we talk to our phone, when we talk to Siri, the speech recognition uh, software is actually a hidden Markov model, or it used to be a hidden Markov model. Now if they have more uh, advanced deep learning techniques like uh, long short-term memory units and so on. But HMMs were used. So what we use them is we actually observe, let's say, rainfall as a time series. We want to predict droughts, or we want to be able to characterize droughts. So we treat droughts as hidden states, not observed. What we are observing is rainfall. The hidden states are droughts. And then we use the hidden Markov model to essentially characterize these drought states and do a probabilistic classification. What probabilistic classification says is, if I look at my phone, it says 20% chance of rain tomorrow, 50% chance, and I make a decision, should I get an umbrella or not? Should I wear a coat or not? For droughts, that is not the case. You go to the US drought monitor, it says you'll have a D2 drought. A D2 drought is a drought of a certain level of severity. D4 is a very severe drought. But it doesn't tell you anything about what percentage chance. It just says D2. They could be off by a wide margin, but you have no way of knowing that. A 20% chance of rain at least gives you an idea of what to do with it. If you are just going to say it, it, it may rain tomorrow, what are you going to do with that information? So probabilistic classification helps us with that. And this essentially shows you a little about the model. And this is just an example of uh, how it differs from the standard techniques. So what you are seeing over here is essentially, let's say, the rainfall series in both cases, the blue line. This graph essentially is a probability scale and it shows at each different, different year that the standard method would give you one drought classification. So basically over here for this year, it's moderate and that's with entire probability one. Whereas if we use a probabilistic classification at each time, the height of the bar tells you with what probability we belong to each class. So your prediction may be, well, we are in moderate drought with this per percentage. It could be a severe drought with this percentage or it could be a mild drought with this percentage. That is much more graded information, which watershed managers then can use to divert resources uh, more confidently. It also shows you the differences that you are going to get between the two methods, because they come from different, uh, other different uh, ideas. If the precipitation is very low, we should be actually thinking of a very extreme drought, which a standard method may not be able to capture. So there are some nuances that uh, we deal with it. Similarly, let's say we are trying to predict extreme droughts in India. Our standard method, by definition, must say give us a uniform value everywhere. It doesn't give you a chance to say 
this area is more prone to droughts than that a different area. Those comparisons are not available because this method was not designed for that comparisons. However, in, the, in some of these more advanced models, we can show that some parts, northwest part of India, is more prone to droughts. Okay. Another example uh, in the monsoon affected regions is to study monsoon breaks and you know, active breaks, uh, active spells and so on, or breaks in the monsoon. And we have online and offline methods. The online method is what we propose, which says after we have sort of figured out the model, as new data becomes available, it keeps updating. So it is basically useful to keep, do a continuous prediction. Okay? Whereas the standard methods that we had, the offline method, you'd have to give it all the data all at once and let the model decide. So you do not know how well it performs on unseen data. Uh, coming back to Indiana, Shi Chika was another very bright student. We were working on droughts in Indiana, and this is an example where we used, again, very advanced statistical techniques, coplas for joint behavior and so on. And many of you will perhaps remember the 1988 drought. That was a very severe drought. Okay? So some of the results that we were able to obtain for use is, so the state of Indiana, in such a deep drought, how much rainfall would be needed to get to normal conditions? So most of the state would have required seven inches of rain. It's very difficult to get. What we were also able to then say is, what is the probability of getting seven inches of rain? So basically between 0.1 and 0.3. So very little chance of getting out of this drought. Because we need a lot of rain, our probability of recovery is very small. And we were able to do forecasts for one month, six months, and so on. Very useful for water planners. Uh, Minu Ramdas is another PhD student. She was also working on drought. She's talking about drought precursors. How can we use our existing knowledge, what we know right now, in terms of various variables like soil moisture, precipitation, runoff, and so on, to say what kind of a drought we will get in, in the next month? And what these graphs are showing is for different variables, let's say if I take the month of March, for these three variables, at least there is some gradation. This is going to be a very severe drought versus a mild drought. Other variables like evaporation, wind speeds, sea level temperatures, they, cannot, they do not have enough uh, resolution to tell you what kind of a drought you will get because they do not contain that much information about droughts. Okay. So this was part of uh, Minu's work. We also, one of the things that we look at is when we have these variables and we are trying to do forecasting, so this is what is where so let's say the calibration data. Let's look at the validation data. For each of these variables, what this scatter shows is that our predictive ability is actually very weak, maybe 10% with each variable. So it's very difficult to make predictions. However, if you have multiple variables and your confidence in each of them is 10 variables and all these variables are pointing towards the same direction, then you can combine their effect to get a much higher confidence level. And usually that is what we have to real rely on because the processes are so complex that working with a single variable, unless it's an extremely strong predictor, you really don't have much to work with. In which case you have to start pooling a lot of other, uh, other knowledge uh, to make reliable predictions. So I'm going to do a, a small diversion and uh, take some time to acknowledge the students. I talked about the work of some of my students. These are essentially many of the students that have worked with me over time and some of my current students, graduate students, uh, very important to my work. They have contributed a lot to my learning. And some postdocs and visiting scholars also, as you can see over here. Several of uh, the students, I mean, they have all been doing well. Several of them are in academic positions. Some of them are professors. You'll notice that one person is a professor and a head so elsewhere. So uh, students are doing well, and that's great. I also want to essentially acknowledge the students by listing some of the awards that we have got with students. Three of my students have got uh, best dissertation awards. I'll, I'll point to some of the more, uh, let's say, prestigious awards with my students. Uh, uh, Shivam Tripathi, let's start with him. KDD is Knowledge, Data, and Discovery. It's one of the machine learning prestigious conferences. Computer science people go to this. And they had a challenge problem. And Shivam, we talked about some of his algorithms. He was essentially awarded a best challenge paper award for, with, with that problem. Uh, so Shivam also was recipient of the Alfred Nobel Prize, which is a joint society award between ASE, AIME, ASME, IEEE, and WSE. All these societies get together 
and you know pick one and this is one of the ASC awards uh, let me see Shichi Gao got a best paper award which was decided by the European Geophysical Union which looks at all hydrology papers in all journals and picks one typically based on how well it has been cited and so on so very very fortunate to have worked with um, many students who have done uh, very well okay. current topics so some of the things that we are doing, for instance, is this is essentially the upper Mississippi River Basin, Ohio River Basin, and so on. When we do have all these stations where we have flow and water quality data, water quality is very sparsely sampled. So what you see in this graph are these are the symbols for water quality. What, using these advanced methods that we talk about, we can reconstruct that series. And we also have the error information about it. Then. From that, we are essentially able to do scatter plots of how well we predict versus observations. We are also able to use this water quality data to figure out what the resilience is of this watershed. In other words, how soon does it recover when a violation occurs? Okay. And uh, this is essentially a histogram. Because we have uncertainty associated with it, we get a histogram of resilience values. So this was also something that Yaman Hawk was essentially working on. So if you have a watershed, we measure water quality at different stations. We measure different um, water quality parameters. They all have different standards. So you may have alachlor, ammonia, atrazine, total suspended solids, different measurements, very sparse. You can reconstruct the series. You can come up with a composite water quality index and error around it to essentially describe the watershed health. Okay. So a lot of work, I think, that we are doing in reliability, resilience, and vulnerability of watersheds based on these concepts. Current topics, so you have uh, two students, Abhishek and Anubhav. We are now looking at how we predict at ungauged basins, where we have no measurements. So we use some machine learning techniques from measured locations, see how well we can do to predict what is happening at unmeasured locations in terms of watershed health. And so when we test these methods, we have essentially areas where we do have measurements, but we don't use them. We only use them to see how well we do. And then you know, we do a scatter plot to get us an estimate of how close we are in making these kinds of predictions at ungauged locations. Some of the current pro problems I'm interested in is when we make measurements of infiltration and soil properties from point measurements, the instruments give conflicting estimates. They're different from each other. So I'm trying to understand why, because we use these instruments a lot, but we are not fully able to explain that. And so this is one of the topics that I'm interested in. So other topic that I have been working on, I want to get back to is when we do have droughts, and I was working with a large team, how does that affect urban growth? How can we design our cities to be more resilient to water shortages? You know, now that we have the capability to predict water shortages, how do we essentially work with that? So these are topics that are of interest to me. Some of the open questions that I would like to address going forward is should the analysis of uncertainty depend on objectives of the study? How do we actually deal with prediction and explanation? So the strategies for both should be different. I would like to be thinking about this. Something that we do a lot in hydrology, worry about reducing uncertainty and improving predictions. And I want to get away from our standard method of doing things and see how we can use predictions of test data during training, which is a slightly different concept, but we'll have to, we'll have to change our way of thinking for how we do these things. We use latent variables in all our statistical models, we need to be able to assign physical interpretation to them. One of the things that I'm really interested in, because this is a very standard problem for us, how do we design models and parameter estimation methods when hydrologic data tend to be very multidimensional and scarce? So when we use deep learning algorithms and machine learning algorithms, these are designed when you have extensive amounts of data. We have the reverse problem. We don't have enough data. We have to, therefore, rethink or, re or adopt, adapt, usually modify these algorithms to work for us. So I find that a very interesting topic. Let me briefly touch upon some teaching interests. So before I came to Purdue, I was at Kansas State. So these are the courses that I taught, undergraduate to graduate level. At Purdue, over time, I have taught, and apart from special topics courses, courses all the way from 100 to 600 level. The 200 level courses I have not taught, but I don't need that to change. It's fine the way it is. <laughs> uh, I, so teaching is something that I really enjoy. 
I thought I would do a very quick diversion and share with you some of my teaching evaluations to, uh, to show you. I should also point out that these evaluations are not meant to be flattering, just that they're interesting. So one of the first ev uh, earlier evaluations I got was, Dr. Rao seems to care about students. I hope this doesn't affect his tenure. So there was a feeling that if you are a good teacher, you're not spending enough time on research. That is not true, I should let you know. OK, this was interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure this is true. Dr. Rao's shirts and pants have the sharpest crease. He seems to put some effort into his clothes, but what is it with the tie selection? I think this is you know, from my earlier days, when I used to be going to work, sometimes my daughter would come and say, Nana, please wear this tie. It would have nothing to do with what I had on, but I would still wear it. And <laughs> OK, this is actually from here. I have figured out Dr. G's limitations as a teacher. He cannot have a class go by without at least one mathematical equation on the board. <laughs> Well, just to make a point, I didn't have any equations in this talk. <laughs> Let's see. This is it says, I started to get differential equations in the groundwater class. Our students generally don't like differential equations. I still can't fathom why, but anyhow. He likes mathematics, nice handwriting, and blackboard technique. So this was, this was good. This was, <laughs> I paid good money for this course and thus deserve a commensurate grade. <laughs> I, I don't think it quite works that way. He uh, give you money though. What's it that? doesn't implicate you for, you know, it's a, I paid good money for this course. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know what, what oh, he's I, saying I, is, I, yeah, I paid good money, I should get a good grade, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, you know, a student who wrote several things. So I have several points to make about Professor Govinda Raju. He's knowledgeable, appears confident and relaxed, cares about student learning. He's a handsome guy. <laughs> But no, there are five points, right? This is four. The fifth point, all the above except D. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, interesting. So student wow. comments are like really, <laughs> no, it, it is fine. I thought it was an interesting comment. But um, uh, I just wanted to you know, share some of these with you. Uh, engagement, uh, right now I'm actually the president of American Institute of Hydrology. This is our big licensing organization. So I'm in my two-year term. Editorial board of several journals. Uh, I'm the editor in chief of Hydrologic Engineering. Kumaresh did it for I don't know 20, 30 odd years for his journal. <clears throat> have been active in many technical committees, had leadership positions, have chaired many other committees, and I continue to do so. I have other consulting work and industry engagement that I have been involved with as well. Looking forward, discovery. You know, in terms of research, I'm happy to collaborate on problems where my skills you know, would be useful. Uh, you know, and if, they, if it makes sense, we would be really happy to do that. <coughs> in terms of learning, I learn a lot from graduate students. Usually, my estimate of how good a graduate student is is based on how much I learned working with that student. Okay? And as I said, I've been very fortunate with students. I would like to essentially teach some advanced courses on infiltration and anon process engaging uncertainty in hydrology, because eventually I think I can write books on these topics. We have done enough work uh, which now prompt me to think I should start putting it together. Moment analysis is something that I have been interested in and may continue to do that. Engagement, would like to continue seeking leadership roles in influential national committees as I go forward. And always looking for right graduate students, always. So this was essentially some of my thoughts what I have done, I showed you some examples of some of my students' work, gives you a flavor for the kinds of things that I do, a little about what I think I'll be doing in the future. So with this, 50 minutes, this is how I'm reading my tea leaves going forward. So thank you very much, and I'll see if you have any questions that I can answer. <laughs> I have a question, quick question. Yes. You know, <laughs> Many of these mo models that you have, yeah. they, I, I understand that data that you have, they are from the past, right? Yes. Or now or past. But uh, we are seeing more and more extreme weather, the event, the 100 year flood taking place every year. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> what would you do with the prediction? How would you correct them? Or how do you, is there uh, ways of? So, so my simple answer is it's not a simple question. It's actually a very complex question. Our all strategies that we have had so far for hydrologic design have assumed that the past is going to be a good representation of what is happening in the future. 
So we used to look at past records to figure out what would be a 100-year event based on probability of exceedance. In future, we are not able to do, essentially make that determination if we assume that we have climate change and things are going to change. So that is an extremely complex problem. Uh, there is really no good answer. Nobody has that answer. All these GCMs, can they do model predictions for 100 years, but they are doing scenario analysis. They say if carbon dioxide gets doubled, if land use changes, if this happens, then this model thinks this is what's going to be the future. This model is not doing great to basically reconstruct the past the, to begin with. And then we are saying this is what's going to do in the future. So when you see these IPCC reports and so on, that's why they use many, many models and try to average them to say, well, let's hope errors are canceling out. And that is their strategy. Actually, that the, it's a very deep question. We don't have the answer to that yet. We do not know how to do hydrologic design. I mean, we have some ideas. Basically, our design is risk-based, fundamentally. When you say a 100-year event, we say society is willing to accept this kind of risk and we will design for a 100-year event, in principle saying that if a flood of a magnitude greater than a 100-year event comes, the structure will fail, but we knew that. That was a risk we were willing to take. How we address this question of risk in a changing climate, that is a very difficult question. Not simple, don't have a good answer. <clears throat> Yes, Mark. So just follow up and following up on that, uh, I was wondering, you mentioned resilience on warship. Yes. I wanted to know, uh, I mean, that seems to be a complex problem. So yeah. Do you determine uh, or do you consider plastic state of the warship? Uh, no. I think our definitions of resilience, uh, I should say we, uh, so being a hydrologist, I'm not, so really the, res the definition of resilience and so on, we would want eco ecologists to give us. What they tell us is say, this is the water quality standard you must meet. And then we'll, we'll figure it out. So what we do is use that to work backwards. The way we define resilience is, in this case is, if there is a violation, what is the probability that the watershed will recover? Or how fast can it recover? That's how resilient it is. And we use how the water quality is changing in time to be able to assess that. So we usually have only either the water, either the watershed is in a failed state because the standards are not being met, or it's in a non-failed state because the standards are met. So there is no in-between so other states. Based on the end yes. So this is where we would essentially hand, handshake with ecologists. They would have to then tell us how to, how to work with that information. So we are, so I'm more in the hydrology part, not in the ecology part. Any other questions? Well, I have a few other questions that we're probably running out of time, so we can. We have five more minutes, but it's up to you. Okay, so then we have a question. <laughs> so earlier you showed uh, in the samples the work that you were doing in Italy, for instance. Uh, you started by saying that you have a very defined patch, yeah. very well controlled sand. Yeah. Right. Well, sand, silt, and clay, three, three kinds of soils. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not sand, of course, that was a different kind of soil. Yes. Uh, how, how well were you able to translate that experiment out in the field? So the, the, the lab scale experiments were essentially done with the idea of trying to understand rainfall runoff and infiltration on sloping surfaces. When we go to the field, we are actually not able to translate information very easily. We have to make field measurements to figure out what is happening in the field because those don't translate. So the scaling problem I was talking about is when we go in the field, my measurements are still only at a point scale. The, the volume that I'm sampling is very small and I perhaps sample that in multiple locations. How do we use these small scale measurements to talk about field scale behavior? So that is the scaling problem that we look at. Otherwise, I think to say that I can uh, take a soil sample, bring it to the lab, do a standard permeometer test and say this is a conductivity, I'm simply not able to apply that conductivity to the field. So that, that scaling, we don't, I know, I'm not sure it can be done. You have to be in the field to make field scale, exp uh, field scale predictions. So just one quick follow up on that, that same uh, top part of your talk. Uh, later on you showed a map uh, in court somewhere. 
is representing different types of solids that, that you get in the watershed? Uh, I don't know which one you are referring to. So, well, you have a map that you can use uh, for characterizing the watershed property. This one? Or? This one. Yeah. Right. Now I see similar colors. Does that mean that you found similar properties? No, no. So what the gradation scale is showing is what is the erosion potential of that particular shaded area. So you know they they basically go from zero to hundred. So watersheds from zero to five have low potential of generating sediment. Twenty to twenty-five or higher values have higher potential for generating sediment, and therefore are sources for sediment. Uh, that comes down the streams. I asked particularly because you said they were random samples. So. No, I, I said what we are not able to do is estimate that or measure that. We are only able to back calculate that by looking at data at the outlet of the watershed and trying to do the inverse problem to say which region could have generated how much sediment. And when we do that, when I go to a different, different rainfall event, Look at different sort of. I get different estimates of which region could have generated that sediment, and hence I said one way to deal with that is to treat it as if it's a random variable. And what we are getting with each rainfall event is one realization of that random variable. And if I have 50, 60 realizations, then I have some way of characterizing the behavior of that uh, of that random variable. Let's thank Professor yeah. Yeah. Right, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.